to say that uh, it's a matter of the intellect is not only um, unfair, it's also um, wrong, and I think a naive way to look at this question. And to, uh, well, something else that I want to add to this is this. This view that religion poisons everything is in fact not true. To take just some elements of people in some religions who are doing much damage uh, in, in this world and then uh, say that every religion is like that and so we need to get rid of it is a serious error. I think it's, it's, uh, it's, it's not historically uh, credible and even uh, empirically. I come from Kenya and I have seen people all over Africa who have sacrificed so much um, their own lives, their families and all that in order to bring uh, the message of the gospel to people who they don't know from Adam only because they believe those people are made in the image of God and they are not causing damage in their lives. They're improving their lives by bringing in education, water and, and hospitals and all that. They're doing a lot of good. If you don't believe me, just Google an article that was written by an atheist named Matthew Paris and the article is entitled, as an atheist, I really believe Africa needs God, and you see the good that missionaries do uh, and people who are committed to Christ do in some of the most difficult parts of the world. So to say that religion poisons everything is not, uh, it's not the best way to look at the role of religion. It's not, it's not intellectually, historically um, honest. Uh, even, it's not even empirically honest because that is really not the case. So um, that view that uh, we need to get rid of religion is doomed to fail right from the start. That's not going to happen. But there's a deeper reason why God won't go away, not just because of practical matters, but there's a much deeper reason why that's the case. And I, I'll just mention one issue here, and that's the question of the meaning and purpose of our existence, the meaning of life, the question of the meaning of life. If God doesn't exist, then life is meaningless. And that's a very difficult thing, as we will see, with a lot of people. Now, when we ask whether or not life has meaning, it's uh, very, very important that we are very clear on what exactly we are, we are talking about because there's a lot of confusion on this issue. People will point to things that they find enjoyable in which, from which they de derive pleasure and satisfaction and say, my life has meaning, because, has meaning because I'm able to enjoy these particular things. But the question of the meaning and the purpose of life has little to do has sometimes has nothing to do with things that we find enjoyable or pleasurable in this world. That's a very different question. When Socrates said that the unexamined life is not worth living, he wasn't asking whether or not there are things that we find meaningful, that we find uh, uh, we, from which we derive pleasure and satisfaction <coughs> in this world. And to see this, we just need to remember, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> We just need to remember that it is possible to find pleasure and satisfaction in things that are nevertheless meaningless. <clears throat> it's possible to find pleasure and satisfaction in things that are not meaningful. I remember when I was uh, going to seminary in California, there's a, a, a public university that I used to go to, to go there to study. I, it was a nice place. I just loved being there. And there was this one man. He would come with a, with a few books in his bag. He would go to the library for about 20 minutes. Then he would get out of the library, go behind the library. There was a recreational park there. And what he would do is he would pull out a tennis ball <clears throat> and he would try uh, for about three, four hours. No kidding. He really did this and maybe he's still doing it today. He would go out with a tennis ball and all he did was try to balance a tennis ball on his index finger. He would put it on his finger, it would roll away from him, he would walk over, pick it up, walk back a few steps, uh, put it back on the finger and he would repeat this over and over again. And he, was having, he seemed to be having a really great time. But I'm sure you would agree, um, psychologically honest people or, or healthy people would agree, and if you don't mind, I'll put you all in that category uh, right now. We would agree that that's, that's a meaningless um, activity and even go further and say that maybe there was something wrong with this man, although he really enjoyed what he was doing. It is possible to find pleasure and satisfaction in things that are not meaningful. So the question of meaning uh, is, is, uh, is uh, the, the issue of pleasure and satisfaction could be sometimes irrelevant to the question of meaning and the purpose of life.
It is also possible <coughs> to engage in activities that are very meaningful without finding any pleasure and satisfaction in them. It's possible to engage in activities that are meaningful <coughs> I haven't spoken in the last few days, so my voice will be fine as we proceed. <clears throat> but I think it's possible to engage in activities that are meaningful without finding any pleasure and satisfaction in them. This is, for example, the case with people who take care of uh, ill uh, or disabled uh, relatives. They would wish their loved one was not in that condition, and yet they take care of them day in, day out. Not because they, uh, they have a lot of pleasure in, have help in uh, taking care of somebody in that condition. They do it because of the person. It's meaningful to take care of a person in that condition. I remember uh, making this point when I was speaking at a place, I think it was in North Dakota, when somebody shouted, uh, me, uh, this person said, I can tell you something else that is very meaningful, <coughs> very meaningful, but not enjoyable, not pleasurable. And I said, what is that? This person shouted, giving birth. Very meaningful, not necessarily enjoyable, uh, I, I am told. So when we ask whether or not life has meaning, what we want to know is this. Do the things we do and who we are as human beings in this world, do they amount to anything in the end or is everything at the end a big fat zero? Um, the French existentialist Albert Camus said that the most important question in life is a question of meaning, or of, of suicide. He said, uh, why not? Why continue living? Why not commit suicide? He said, everything else in philosophy is elementary when you consider the question of why continue with your existence. And I'll just give read another quote here just because this, uh, this is an issue that some people like to dispute, but I think it's, it's really clear that if God doesn't exist, nothing we do in this world in the end matters. And this is what how Bertrand Russell, who's one of the most... Uh, a respected philosopher mathematician of the last century said, he said this, that man is a product of causes which, which had no prevention of the end they were achieving, that his origin, his growth, his hopes and fears, his loves and his beliefs are but the outcome of accidental collocations of atoms, that no fire, no heroism, no intensity of thought and feeling can preserve an individual life beyond the grave, that all the labors of the ages, all the devotion, all the inspiration, all the noonday brightness of human genius are destined to extinction in the vast death of the solar system and that the whole temple of man's achievement must inevitably be buried beneath the debris of a universe in ruins. All these things, if not quite beyond dispute, are yet so nearly certain so nearly certain that no philosophy which rejects them can hope to stand. Only within the scaffolding of these truths, only on the firm foundation of unyielding despair, can the soul's salvation henceforth be safely built. That when you think about life and everything we are trying to achieve in this world, you have to come to the point where you admit to yourself, where you agree that there is nothing we do in this world, not even us as human beings, in the end matters. Everything comes to an end and life doesn't matter at all. Maybe you've never had the struggle or taken the time to consider this issue, this question of the meaning and the purpose of life. But I want to tell you, it's really not a joke. I have personally talked to people who have told me that the only reason they have chosen not to take their own lives is because of the fear of the unknown. There are people who live with this kind of struggle, asking these type of questions about the meaning and the purpose of life. I read a statistic recently that I'm still having a hard time wrapping my mind around, and it was this. The U.S. loses 400 medical doctors every year to suicide. 400 medical doctors to suicide. This is a serious issue about the meaning and the purpose of life. And yet, if you think about life, and you come to the conclusion that God doesn't exist, that your life really is meaningless, that seems like, like a very logical step to take. But of course, if God exists, then life, life does have meaning. And it's, our, our existence in this world has a purpose for, for, uh, because God put us here for a reason. Again, Socrates said that the, un the unexamined life is not worth living. And I'm saying this. The examined life, examining your life, 
if God doesn't exist, uh, uh, the examined life may also not be worth living. Obviously, if you don't have any of these struggles at all, you never think about um, um, the meaning of life, you, you, that's not an issue you worry about at all. Um, if God, if it turns out that God doesn't exist, it may be, it, it wouldn't matter for you because uh, when you're done, when you're when you die, you're finished. You're all of us. We, we are gone, and there's nothing to worry about. We wouldn't be there to worry about anything. But what if it is true that God does, in fact, exist? The worst thing you can do is to brush God off. So this is a truly significant, truly important question that none of us can, be, can afford to ignore. So the first, my first point was, this question is an indispensable one for any human being. Looking at our world, we cannot understand our world today without religion, and even deeper than that, the purpose of our existence, the meaning of life in this world, is such an important issue that we cannot afford to ignore it. And if God does, ex does exist, the worst thing you and I can do is to brush him off, to believe as though God doesn't exist. Now, the fact that, but the fact that um, pragmatically we cannot understand our world without religion is intellectually respectable and uh, it, it deals with the issue of the question of the meaning of life and all that, that doesn't lead to the conclusion that therefore God exists. It doesn't lead to that conclusion. So what I want to do uh, uh, in the next few minutes is to give you some reasons why I think it makes sense for us to believe in God and to worship God, uh, even without first looking at the Bible, or, or, although we'll be finishing there. And the first thing that I want to offer is this, the origin and the nature of the universe. The origin and the nature of the universe. Um, the universe that we inhabit points us to the existence of God. See, the, ba the most basic assumption um, of atheism today is a view called physicalism, the view that only the physical universe exists. There is nothing outside the physical universe. The physical universe is a closed system. That's why you, you have to believe, uh, if you are a, a, an atheist uh, today, that God doesn't exist, there's not, no, no, no immaterial realities and all that. I know, um, I know we can go into detail trying to define these 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 terms, but I'm trying to I'm, I'm trying to make sure that we uh, we don't get sidetracked too far into details on these issues. But if you deny the existence of God, you are left with the view that only the physical universe exists. Um, now, I want to argue that based on what we know about our world today, that's not really the best way to think about 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 the universe and especially. Where it, where, it came from, where it came from. I'm going to argue that the origin and the nature of the universe give us good reasons to think that the physical universe is really not all there is. So let's begin with the origin of the universe. Human beings have always had a, had a suspicion that there is something beyond the physical universe, that the physical universe is not all there is. They have tried, for example, philosophers have tried to argue, uh, to argue this point using um, just philosophy, and they have, come to, they have come up with arguments that I think are, 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 are pretty good. Because when you look, for example, at the nature of time, Time is made up of uh, moments that succeed each other. You can count it in seconds or hours or, or, or weeks or years or, or months or, or whatever. For example, we are in the year 2014. It's been 100 years since the year 1914, 200 years since the year uh, 1814 and so on. And we can just keep going back, uh, back in the past. The problem is this. If the past is infinite, we would never be able to get to the year 2014. That would never be possible. Let's, let's take, let's, let me give you an example. Take for example, let's assume the year 2014 is a domino. Let's mark it X. If an infinite number of dominoes had to fall before we could get to this domino X 2014, we would never get to the present. And yet, here we are. So the past, philosophers have argued, cannot be infinite in the past. And even if it were possible for us to cross an, an, an infinite number of moments to get to the present, we could never do so by adding one moment 
after another. You can never have an infinite collection of anything. That's an abstract concept. It's never in, 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 uh, instantiated in reality because you can always take something else out or add something in. So the past cannot be in, uh, infinite. And this seems to be uh, confirmed by science today. Uh, for, for example, uh, science, um, scientists tell us that time, space, matter, and energy all came into existence a finite time ago. They all came into existence a finite time ago. And as human beings, we have to ask the question, where in the world did they come from? Where did the universe come from if it has not always existed? Because out of nothing, the most confirmed laws of thought, uh, the basic way of, ways of thinking is that out of nothing, if you begin with nothing, you are never going to be able to get anything. But if it is true that God exists, then we have an explanation for the origin of the universe. But uh, this, this, un this, um, this uh, argument has been defended, for example, by William Lane Craig. In detail, you can look at his work. Uh, and he presents the arguments as follows. It's called the Kalam cosmological argument. Number one, whatever begins to exist has a cause. Number two, the universe began to exist. And number three, therefore the universe has a cause. And then when we look at the nature of the universe itself, what we find is that the, uh, the universe we live in is highly complex. It's very, very complicated. That it has some uh, it depends on, a, on a, a narrow range of what, of what uh, physicists call constants. Just given in nature, in, in the laws of nature, just given uh, they, these constants could have different values, and yet they have to have uh, certain values to allow for the existence of life, and they are all independent of each other. Uh, a constant of nature is, is uh, for example, I'll give you an example, in Newton's law of gravity, the, the universal gravitational constant is given as g. Now, to calculate the gravitational force between two bodies attracting each other, you have to, to multiply the product of the masses of the two bodies with, it, with this constant g, and then divide by the square of the distance between them. Now, the masses can be different. Uh, and, and the distance, of course, can, can vary. But the constant g that you multiply with, that never changes, it's just given. And there's no, if God doesn't exist, there is no <clears throat> explanation as to why the universe has the shape that it does, especially given the fact that these constants of nature, and there are many of them, are independent of each other. How in the world did this happen if the universe, uh, if God doesn't exist? It makes a lot of sense if God does exist. But we can even go further and ask ourselves this question. What kind of a, an entity brought the universe into existence? What kind of an entity would it have to be? It would have to be immaterial because it created a space. It would have to be timeless because it, it created time and existed outside time. And it must be enormously powerful given the vastness of the universe. It must be extremely intelligent given the complexity of the universe. And I would argue it must be personal because it could, it could make decisions. It could make decisions. These are the very attributes that our theologians have always given uh, to God. And so even from science itself, uh, what we know about our universe leads us to God. I know there are many models being developed to try and avoid the beginning of the universe, but the accepted view today is that the universe began to exist. That's, that's, that's the accepted view. And so given what we know now, uh, what science is telling us is that the universe was created by an intelligent being, by God, and so the physical universe really is not all there is. Reflecting on all this, Dr. Arnold Pentheus, a Nobel Prize winning astrophysicist who discovered the cosmic microwave background radiation of the universe that provided further evidence for the Big Bang, said the following, In order to achieve consistency with our observations, we must assume not only creation of matter and energy out of nothing, but creation of space and time as well. The best data we have are exactly what I would have predicted had I nothing to go on but the five books of Moses, the Psalms, and the Bible as a whole. Similarly, years ago, uh, Robert Jastrow, 
who was the head of the NASA's Goddard Institute for Space Studies, uh, said the following, and himself, he wasn't a believer. He said this in his book, God and the Astronomers. He said this, For the scientist who has lived by his faith in the power of reason, the story ends like a bad dream. He has scaled the mountains of ignorance, is about to conquer the highest peak. As he pulls himself over the final rock, he is greeted by a band of theologians who have been sitting there for centuries. The origin and nature of the universe point powerfully to a reality beyond the physical, uh, and, this is, uh, and this reality, I would argue, is God. This is how the psalmist put it, um, Psalm 19, from verse 1 to verse 4. The heavens declare the glory of God, the skies proclaim the work of His hands. Day after day they pour forth speech, night after night they reveal knowledge. They have no speech, they use no words, no sound is heard from them, yet their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the earth. And in Genesis, the way the Bible begins, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The Bible has proven itself over and over again in these matters. And once again, all these points us to the existence of a realm beyond just the physical, to the existence of God, I would argue. So the origin and the nature of the universe point us uh, to God. The other reality which, uh, which we are all confronted, with which we are all confronted, and which we cannot rationally deny, is the reality and power of morality in our world, the reality and power of morality in our world, our experience of right and wrong, our experience of morality. Not only do we live in a universe that um, had uh, an origin that began to exist, it's highly complicated. We also find ourselves existing in a universe that comes packaged with rules of behavior with do's and don'ts, rules of behavior that we did not invent, they do not depend on us. Morality is objective, it has, it has nothing to do with us as human beings in terms of uh, inventing it and all that. We do not invent morality, we discover right and wrong. And if that is true, this points us to the, to the existence of a moral being uh, uh, and the Bible says that we were made in His image, and this fits perfectly, fits very well with our experience. So what do I mean when I say that morality is objective? To say that morality is objective is to say that um, whether something is right or, or wrong does not depend on people's beliefs, opinions, or contracts. If something is right, it is right even if everybody in the world came to believe that it is wrong. And if something is wrong, it's going to be wrong, even if everybody in the world came to believe that it is right. That's what uh, it means to say that morality is objective. We do not invent the laws of morality, we discover them. We find ourselves existing in a world that simply has these, these laws given to us, these laws of, of right and wrong. And just think about yourself, think, think about things that uh, you consider to be very unjust uh, in this world. For many atheists, it would be the, 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 inquisition, the inquisition of the Crusades and all that. They are prepared to say that they, those are objectively wrong. But there is a lot of injustice that goes on in this world, and we know that morality is really never fulfilled in many cases. That things happen in this world that can never be completed, and so morality tends to mock us if God doesn't ex exist, if it's real, and yet uh, our moral aspirations are never truly fulfilled, then uh, there's something, some v a, a very, very serious mistake. I remember reading uh, an article in a newspaper, in, unfortunately, in my own country of Kenya, and what this article was about was about a woman who had gone to the hospital. She had, she had uh, given birth to a child through C-section, and in the process, the doctors had cut the baby's face um, uh, several times, and the baby was having a very hard time uh, breathing. The baby could not uh, breastfeed and breathe at the same time. And so the mother naturally was very worried about it, but they told her, you just take your, your baby home, uh, uh, the baby will be fine in just a few days. Well, the baby wasn't fine in just a few days. When she came back to the hospital to bring the baby back to the hospital so the doctors could, could look at the baby, you know what she was told? They said to her, if you ever set foot in this hospital again, 
we are going to call the authorities on you because uh, because of what you have done to your child. They denied ever having done anything to, to the child. Now, can anyone look at that situation and tell me that that kind of kind of injustice is not wrong? You know, it's it's a it's, it's a it's a very sad thing to remember that most people in this world live under such a huge cloud of injustice and they're never going to get justice in this life. But if God exists, all those scales will be evened. And since we know uh, from experience that, morality, that, that we are moral beings in a moral universe, we can be confident that morality really does point, uh, point us to God. But there's another aspect of morality that is very, very important, and that is the concept of duty or obligation. That there are things that we are obligated to do. You have moral obligations. By the way, just because something is good, it doesn't mean you're obligated to do it. It would be, for example, a very nice idea for me to walk down the street at a hospital and ask if there's any patient in this hospital who needs a kidney because I have to, I can, I can donate one. That would be a very good thing to do, but I'm not obligated to do that. And yet there are other things that I am obligated, for example, taking care of my children. I have those, those, those obligations and not stealing and, and, and all that. Um, we have uh, these moral obligations, and these moral obligations have, uh, have again, uh, we are obligated to each other as human beings, but obligation goes beyond that. If you drown somebody, just the two of you in the forest somewhere, and you drown somebody so that no other human being will ever find out, you are still guilty. You, you, are still, you, you, are, you, you should still be held accountable for your actions, even though nobody, nobody else saw it. So morality has within it this idea of obligation, which is like a debt that is owed. But to whom is it owed if God doesn't exist? That's why I, I love this topic of, uh, of, of morality, because it, to me, I think it's, it's, it's one, of the, one of the clearest pointers to our divine origin, that we were created by a God who is, uh, who is a moral being and who made us in his image. So what the Bible says seems to fit perfectly with our experience in this world. But we can even go further than that and ask ourselves this question. What an amazing coincidence would it be that there is this realm of morality, right and wrong, um, that we are not connected to, and yet we happen to be the kinds of creatures that have um, immediate awareness of this morality. We are immediately aware of it, and then we, have, we recognize ourselves as having intrinsic value and intrinsic worth as human beings, that that morality applies to us, the things that we should not do to other human beings. And also, we are, we are made with free will, we have free will and we can make choices. And then we have all these checks and balances uh, that, that keep us connected to this realm of morality, like, like shame uh, and, and praise and blame and all this. How do all these things conspire to work together to make us connected, to connect us to this realm if we were not made uh, by, by a moral being? It all these issues make sense. They fit perfectly if we were created by the living God. And many philosophers, uh, including uh, many atheists, acknowledge the point and they say that if God doesn't exist, then we should stop talking about uh, uh, objective morality and maybe try to account for morality in a different way. For example, through evolution, through contracts and all that. But when you do that, you've given up the, con the concept of, uh, of, uh, of the objectivity of morality. You give that up and then what, whatever we decide as human beings, if the back stops with us, if what we decide is what is moral, then almost uh, anything goes. We may, we may forego some things because they may not have survival value and we, we care about our own survival, but there will be nothing wrong with anything that we do in this world. So our experience of morality in this world points us to the reality of God. Uh, the argument can be stated as follows. If moral values and duties are objectively real, then God exists. Objective moral values and duties are objectively real, therefore God exists. Or well, that should be moral values and duties are objectively real, therefore God exists. So my first major point was, was that the question of God, God's existence is one of the most important, probably the most important question any human being can think about. And the second is that we have good reasons to think uh, 
that God does in fact exist. We have good reasons to think that God does in fact ex exist. The physical universe is not all there is. We live in a complicated universe uh, that has morality built into it and we are made in such a way that we are able to recognize this moral realm and even to understand this universe. And that makes sense if our source is an intelligent moral being. So theism is a much better explanation of our existence in this world and it gives us the meaning and the purpose that we are all looking for in a very powerful way. And the final point that I want to make is that God has revealed himself in the person of Jesus Christ. That's just what I said when I, when I talked about the contribution that the Bible makes to this issue. God has revealed himself in the person of Jesus Christ. Christ. Because what we have said so far may lead us to the conclusion that, the, that, that there is a reality beyond the physical and it has all those characteristics that, that I was talking about, but that hasn't led us to the, to the one God worshipped uh, by Bible-believing Christians. Uh, how do we get from there to, um, to the existence of God worshipped by Christians? Uh, and that's where, well, that's where we need to look at the contribution that the Bible makes to this whole debate. Now one of the questions that I'm asked, and many people ask this all the time, is, is this. Have you looked at all the worldviews in existence to make sure that you haven't missed something? Is it not possible that of all the views out there that you have missed something, there may be another one that is more coherent than, than theism? Uh, um, how can you be so confident that you have faith in God, the Bible is, is the word of God when you haven't read each and every other book and looked at all the other ways of uh, thinking about, about the world. Now that sounds like a very daunting question, but the answer to it is really not that difficult because all the worldviews in existence can be grouped under three categories depending on what they say about God and the universe. So depending on what our worldview says about God and the universe, it will fall under one or three categories. On the one extreme you have the view that only God exists. The universe doesn't exist. And this is why you'll find many of the Eastern religions and the New Age movement and all that, that reality at its core is all one inclusive whole. And you ask yourself the question, what about all the people and the desks and the uh, cameras and everything that, 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 that I may be looking at? What about all these things? What they, when, what they tell you is this. Those things are like drops out of the ocean. If you take the drop and put it back in the ocean, its individuality disappears and all you have is just water, just, just the ocean. And we, are, we, suffer, we suffer illusions when we see all these different uh, distinctions. So if we can learn how to meditate and get to the state where we only uh, see th this all one inclusive whole, then we'll see that everything is one. Only God exists. On the other extreme, you have the view that only the universe exists. God doesn't exist. Only the universe exists. And under, under that, you obviously have naturalism and different types of naturalism are, are, are come up under that. And that's why you find atheism as well. Only the physical universe, only the universe exists. In the middle, you have the view that both God and the universe exist. God is eternal and uncaused and the universe was created by God. And under that, you have Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. So it's really not difficult to, to evaluate all these views without being experts in all of them. All you need to know is what they say about God and the universe. Now, we don't have the time to offer a, a critique of these different views. That's a, a, a lecture for another day. But, I'm, but I will tell you that it's... Uh, I find it very difficult to believe, for example, that only God exists, I don't exist, because it's not possible for you to, to deny your own existence. You have to exist to say that you don't exist. So I find a lot of uh, logical problems with this view. And when they tell me, for example, when talking about the problem of, of, of evil, that what I have to do is to learn how to meditate and then see that everything is one so that evil disappears, I am still hurting. So it doesn't even work in practice. It's a serious problem. I remember speaking to a friend of mine who is deeply committed to this way of thinking, the New Age movement and all that. And he said to me, 
If you can learn how to meditate properly, you'll be able to see that everything in the end is just one. Everything is one. I said to him, uh, he says, you'll be able to see you don't, you don't exist, that everything is one. So I said to him, <coughs> explain what, if I'm hearing you, you correctly, what you're telling me is this. <coughs> That if I can learn how to meditate, and I achieve that goal of uh, learning how to meditate, I would, uh, once, I, uh, once I achieve it, I cease to exist. He's, uh, uh, he said, yes. That's what I'm telling you. I said to him, have you been able to do that yourself? And he said, yes. I said to him, if it is true, well, that when you learn, you learn how to meditate like this, you cease to exist when you achieve your goal, how in the world can you be able to come back and tell me anything about it? about your experience when you are not there in the first place. I'm still waiting for an answer to that question. I, I, I see way too many problems with thinking that only God exists, the universe doesn't exist, at least I exist and I cannot deny my own existence. What about the view that the physical universe is all there is? Well, we've talked about that quite a bit. The physical universe is not all there is given what we know about our, own, about our own existence in this world. So it's really not difficult to deal with these issues without being an expert in, in all of them. So why the Bible? Why settle with the Bible? Or what contribution does the Bible make to all this debate? Uh, and the answer, the old Sunday school answer to this question is Jesus. The answer is Jesus in this case. Uh, his death, his resurrection, his life, his teachings, he proved that he really was who he said uh, that, that, that he was. And what I'm going to do is give you, um, give you just three reasons why, uh, why I think that the teaching, the life and the teachings of Jesus need to be taken seriously by anybody who's considering this, these issues. And the first reason I'll give you is the diagnosis Jesus gave to the human condition. The diagnosis he gave to the human condition. Jesus said that our key problem, our main problem, is that we have sinned and rebelled against a holy God. That that's our main problem. We know exactly what we ought to do, what we should be, but we just choose to do the opposite. According to the view that only God exists, our main problem is ignorance, and what we need is enlightenment. Atheism, I would argue, doesn't even have a way to frame the question, let alone to begin to answer it. Jesus said that our main problem is not ignorance, not enlightenment, lack of enlightenment. Our main problem is that we have sinned and rebelled against a holy God. And we all prove Jesus right every waking moment of our day. I remember being invited to speak at the Centers for Disease Control headquarters here in Atlanta. Um, I'm not a U.S. citizen, so they had to clear me ahead of time. They sent me a stack of forms that thick to fill out. They wanted to know every address I've ever had, every phone number I've ever had, every country, I ever, uh, every country I ever visited, and how many times, and who I went to see, and what my address was there. All kinds of questions. They asked me uh, when I was born, where I was born. I anticipated the question why I was born as well such details. And then when I, when I went there, when I went to the, got to the CDC on the day um, uh, that I was, I was speaking there, a colleague and I what, were ordered out of the car. They searched everything in the car. Under the car, they took out um, the, the floor mats, the, um, the turn over the visors and the, the engine, and they checked everywhere. Then they told us, park the car over here. So we, we, we parked over there. And then going in was like going through the airport. They gave us a badge and they said we could not go to any room. I could not go to any room except the room where I was speaking. And I could not go by myself anywhere. There had to be somebody from the CDC with me the whole time. Do you know what was so ironic about that whole experience? I was there to convince them that human beings are sinful. Why in the world would they go to that length to guard themselves against other human beings if we didn't already believe that? We know exactly what we are like as human beings. We just make accommodation for sin in our lives over and over again. But we know, once again, exactly what we are like. Our parents and teachers spend the first few years of our lives teaching us how to say and write our own names. And then we spend the rest of our lives traveling, traveling around 
with photo IDs to prove that the names we call ourselves are really our names. We invent superb machines like computers, but we also have to invent sophisticated software to keep those machines safe from viruses which we ourselves create. It is not enough to have a, 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 a an email account or a bank account, you also need a password not only to, uh, not to you to protect yourself from other human beings. We make accommodation for sin and we become used to living like that so much that we don't really see its destructiveness and it becomes an old friend. But the Bible has a very grim sin of view of what sin is because sin is a defect uh, in our being. It was not meant to be the original part of who we are as human beings in this world. It distorts God's people into grotesque distortions of what God intended for them to be. Jesus said that our main problem is sin, not ignorance. <clears throat> uh, when uh, some misguided young man breaks into the local gas station, we are told that some education and a little training in manners would solve that problem. What do we say when our Ivy League educated luminaries bankrupt our financial systems? D.L. Moody said this, that if a man is stealing nuts and balls along the railway line and you take him to college and educate him, by the end of his college education, he'll be able to steal the whole railway line. We know that we are sinful beings. We just make accommodation for sin in our own lives. And we, if we don't deal with this, with it, we end up far and farther and farther away from God's original intention for each one of us. But Jesus did not just diagnose the problem, he also offered a solution on the cross. He offered a solution on the cross. He died in your place and in my place, thereby honoring God's justice for demonstrating God's love at the same time. He solved that problem. He, he diagnosed the problem, then he offered a solution to the problem. And thirdly, his influence throughout history is, unde is undeniable. His influence throughout history is undeniable. Um, H.W. Lecky, who was uh, not a believer, wrote the following, looking at the life of Jesus. He said this, the simple record of these three short years of active life has done more to regenerate and soften mankind than all the disquisitions of philosophers and all the exhortations of moralists. This was not an unbeliever commenting on the life of Jesus. It's undeniable what his teaching and his life has done throughout history. And he continues to change not just history, but individual lives, even today, just as he changed mine. I did not grow up in a Christian home. I did not know anybody among my relatives who was a believer. And uh, the only people that I knew who were believers in my neighborhood had some, very, had some very strange behaviors. The women wore long dresses and they covered their heads and they would never take their children or they would not go to the hospital. And some of the women died of childbirth and their children kept dying of uh, easily treatable diseases. And that was a very, very troubling thing. They, ca they call themselves uh, born again. They claim to have been to be born again. And um, I remember my, my, my family, my friends and I, were, we were all very concerned about them. The very last thing we wanted to do was to be identified with anybody who, who read the Bible or who believed in the Bible who, or who, who claimed to be born again because that was, the, it was like the end of the world to us. But I remember my family moving to a different place where there were other types of Christians who looked normal and yet they believed in the Bible. So I started to take it a little bit more seriously. And a missionary friend of mine who's uh, from the U.S. actually, uh, took it upon himself to help me understand what the Bible uh, was about. So I ended up giving my life to Christ. And during, during the time that I gave my life to Christ, uh, God did amazing things in my life in answer to prayer now that I won't go into that uh, right now. But my mom and dad were having serious problems backing up a little bit uh, further um, a couple of years before. And they had sent my sister and I to go and live with my grandmother. And my grandmother was like a second her mom to us because we lived with her for I think for almost a year or two years, my, just my sister and I. So we got to know her really, really well and to love her. She was highly respected in, in, in her neighborhood. Uh, she was also addicted to, to tobacco. She used to sniff tobacco. When she ran out of it, we would walk long distances even at night uh, to get it for her. And um, 
And she was also very much afraid of death because of some superstitious ideas that she held. So when I became a Christian, I wanted to share this message with her. I could not wait for, her, for, for, for me to go to her place or for her to come over so I could tell her about salvation. Uh, when, when I did, I told her about the Bible and about God and all that. She was very disappointed in me. She said to me, the only reason you have fallen for the white man's religion is because you are too young to understand what these people did to us. She had watched as a kid the missionary come in and, and the colonialists came in at the same time. They had taken everything from her family and she wanted nothing to do with their religion. But I kept praying for her and explain, trying to explain the gospel to her and there was no reaction. Before I left Kenya to come to the U.S., I took another chance to explain the gospel to her. Again, no reaction of any kind. I didn't even know whether she heard me. I left, came to the U.S., and I was here for about six and a half years, not having gone back to Kenya. I called home, and she happened. My grandmother happened to be there, and she asked if she could speak to me. And when she came to the phone, I knew she had something very important to share with me. She told me that uh, she said to me, Child, I heard what you told me about asking Jesus to forgive me of my sins. And she said, I tried it. I asked him to. And you know what? He did. The moment I prayed to receive Christ, he took away the desire to sniff tobacco. I have never touched it ever since, never had the desire for it at all. And then she said this, Long before you were born, I used to make uh, purses, and I have made one for your wife by which she can remember me until...